morning, everyone. Pastor Mark Hensley here from the Pikes Peak Park Baptist Church here in Colorado Springs. I want to welcome you to the service today. Let us know where you're watching from. If there's any specific way we can pray for you, please let us know. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for this day filled with promises and hope because you are alive and because you live, we live also. Thank you for the privilege to be here with friends. And I pray that you would speak to our hearts your message for this day. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to show you a picture of the world's most traveled man. In fact, this man who's of Greek descent has traveled to every country of the world, 195 countries. His name is Babis Bezos. Try to say that three times really fast. He was once reflecting on his travels and he thought to himself and he expressed it out loud, what else is there left to see? Here's what he said. When I first started traveling at the age of 22, I used to say that I'd that if I managed to go on 30 trips in my lifetime, I would have seen the world. When I exceeded 80 trips, I felt I was still missing. And then now 200 plus. And that was back when he was thinking back to the early years of travel. He said, now I've been on over 1,000 trips. And I know that what remains to be seen is more than what I've seen. That's the way it goes. And then he said this, the more you travel, the more you discover. The feeling of going further cannot be taught through documentaries. Life is about choices that lead to action, strung together through our lifetime, moment by moment decisions that lead us to different and varying places. Do you ever wish you could go back and unwind a decision you made way back when. I'm sure you do. <clears throat> Believers, however, must choose each day to be in the center of the will of God and to say with absolute trust, lead on, O King Eternal. Today, I'm thinking about the Apostle Paul, who at the time of this writing in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 16 is an aging missionary, feeling the distress and the pressure of ministry, but he allows us today a glimpse of his itinerary, and he had plans, and he had thoughts, and objectives, and desires, and hopes, just as we all do. New vistas and roads open to us, sometimes just for a moment, how we need to be discerning in the choices of life. Today, the Apostle Paul reminds us today that life offers both opportunity and opposition. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, 5 through 9, under that title, Opportunities and Opposition. I will visit you after passing through Macedonia. For I intend to pass through Macedonia, and perhaps I will stay with you or even spend the winter so that you may help me on my journey wherever I go. For I do not want to see you now just in passing. I want to spend some time with you, if the Lord permits. But I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a wide door for effective work has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. Opportunities... And opposition reminds us to seek the Lord in our decisions. John Calvin, the reformer, once said that regret is a labyrinth from which there is no escape, meaning it you can't go back and change what you did that got you to where you are. And we know that we can't get in a H.G. Wells time machine and go back, but we can move forward. And why we can't start over, we can start from here and have a new ending. Today we'll be reminded of that. We'll re be reminded that doors of opportunity are opening. We need to believe that. We need to have faith for that. We need to redeem the time because night is coming, Jesus said, when no man works. And then finally, you'll see the reality of opposition. Life is not always going to be easy. 
Uh, sometimes we feel like for every step forward, there's two steps back. And someone well said, the door of opportunity often swings on the hinges of opposition. But God will make a way where there seems to be no way. Notice, first of all, under that title, opportunity is an opposition that we need to seek the Lord in our decisions. Paul is pretty demonstrative here, isn't he? I will visit you after passing through Macedonia. For I intend to pass through Macedonia, and perhaps I will stay with you or even spend the winter so that you may help me on my journey wherever I go. In your life, questions will arise. Is this the right direction? Is this the right decision? I love what Ron Dunn once said about that. He's been with the Lord for a number of years, an Oklahoma evangelist. He said, if we really want God's will for our lives, he won't let you make the wrong decision. But sometimes I feel like we still do. Maybe we have um, improper ambition or in, improper expectations. Maybe we haven't sought godly counsel or we've just kind of rushed into a decision I think it's so important to weigh decisions and contemplate because a decision has far-reaching repercussions for the people around us. And so it's so imperative. As Paul is saying, I will go through Macedonia. In fact, he won't go through Macedonia uh, at this juncture in his ministry career. He's got to go back and stay in Ephesus because God was doing a work there. And there was opposition, but he knew the opportunity was vast, and so he stayed. This will be the lo longest time he pastored a church, about three years in Ephesus, a church that was lauded for its love and then warned that it didn't have love 30 years later. The decisions we make with the direction of our lives really can be impactful and sometimes can be discouraging. And you'll wonder sometimes, should I take this opportunity? Should I go through this door? I think sometimes of the quote that's helped me through my own life's ministry. I may not be where I thought I would be, but I think I'm where I'm supposed to be. But getting from A to B, sometimes the Lord will allow you to take different paths that still are on the way to where he wants you to teach us this moment by moment abiding in him. Now, of course, there are decisions of life that I don't believe uh, the God of the universe is standing by in rapt attention to see what color socks you'll choose or what shirt or if you'll go with plaids or stripes. Don't, by the way, don't mix those two up. I did that once as a young husband and my wife had to set me straight. <laughs> this does not suggest that he is uninterested. But in many things of life, um, we have freedom in those choices. And often when we come against a decision of consequence, we need to ask ourselves some uh, pointed thinking. What I'm about to do, does it honor the Lord? Could I do what I'm about to do with Jesus sitting right next to me? Will it bring him honor? That ties up that syllogism to me. Paul reminds us today that even travel plans and the length of time we'll stay somewhere should be something that we bring to the Lord. He says, I don't want to just see you in passing. I hope to spend some time with you if the Lord permits. Spending time with the people we love is so critical today. I read that uh, years ago that a, a father of a toddler spends just a little bit of time with them a day. And I understand life's busy, work is ever around us, but those moments with those little children, those impressionable children are so invaluable. In fact, <clears throat> I'd read once that for every positive word spoken in a home to a child, there's usually 10 negative words spoken to a child. Lift those people in your life. Affirm them. Last night, uh, Laura and I were uh, talking to our middle son, Ben, and she asked him, if you look back in time 
As a child, what's one of your fondest memories? And it didn't take him long to surface a memory of, of hanging out with me as his dad and watching TV and him being a little toddler and pretty soon I'm pinching an ear and starting a, a wrestling match and the laughter and the joy of those times with my sons. I now have that with my grandson. I want to make those memories. I, I want to be remembered like that, don't you? Spending time with people is valuable. That's what the Apostle Paul wants to do. He wants to spend time uh, with the Corinthian people, uh, but he's also planning to go through Macedonia, if it is the Lord's will. We know from Paul's journals, from his writings, that he was very sensitive to God directing him. And you see that reflected here. There are doors, doors of opportunity are opening. The Apostle Paul says, but I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a wide door of effective work is open to me, and there are many adversaries. The Apostle Paul felt it right to stay in Ephesus until Pentecost. Pente meaning 50 days after Passover. His reasoning helps us to understand valuable lessons and reasons for seeking and determining the will of God in a ministry situation, but in a life situation. Paul wanted to remain in Ephesus temporarily because a great door of opportunity, effective work, was opening for him. In other words, Paul saw that his efforts in Ephesus were succeeding but he recognized his success as an indication that he should continue to work there. That's what he saw. The second thing he reminds us of today is beyond this, Paul saw resistance from the world as an indication that he should stay for a while. That cuts against a lot of how we feel about any place, anywhere. We often conclude that life should be easier, especially as you get older. But sometimes it's not. Sometimes the winds of adversity blow against us. Do you remember when the Lord um, went up to a mountain to pray and he had sent the disciples to go across the Sea of Galilee? The Bible says he saw them. And they were, he saw them in the King James. They were straining against the oars because the wind was against them. Sometimes the wind will be against you spiritually or occupationally or physically. When that happens, that's the time to double down and say, Lord, if you're leading me to this, you can lead me through this. And stay faithful in season and out. The Apostle Paul is reminding us that it's not always going to be easy. And we shouldn't anticipate that it's going to be easy. From his point of view, believers involved in godly ministry will suffer persecution from the world. And our Lord taught that as well. In this world, you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome this world. So Paul stayed in Ephesus because there were many people opposed to him. <laughs> that seems so contrary to how we think. We think, well, there's this many people against me. I want to get out of Dodge. But self-preservation in walking with the Lord is not the goal. The goal is to honor him with our life, and maybe he sent you in a difficult place to bloom where you are planted. The Holy Spirit is at work in his life. He's sensitive to the Holy Spirit. He also showed himself to be flexible. He is ready to change his plans if the Lord directed him. I think of one of the most historical, amazing opportunities. In 1269, Kublai Khan of the Mongols sent a request to Rome for a hundred wise men of the Christian religion. And this is what he said, so I shall be baptized. Kublai Khan said this. One of the most feared leaders of the Mongolian people who ever lived. And when I shall be baptized, all of my men will be baptized and their subjects will be baptized. And so there will be more Christians here than any other part of the world. 
the Mongols at that time were wavering in the choice of a religion. It might have been, as Kublai Khan forecasted, the greatest mass potential religious movement up to that time, at least in that part of the world. The history of Asia could have been changed. But you say, Pastor, what actually happened? Well, Pope Gregory X was contacted by Kublai Khan, and what he did when he was asked for a hundred godly people to come and teach Christianity, he sent two friars, two Dominican friars. They got as far as Armenia, and the weather was horrendous, it was a treacherous journey, so they turned their backs and went home. And so passed potentially the greatest missionary opportunity in the history of the church. Now think about this. If Christianity, however, had been the religion that Kublai Khan and his followers embraced, Mongolia and possibly other countries in Asia today might have become Christian. Christianity might have swept across Asia the way it did across Europe. And the strongholds of Islam and communism may have never gained a foothold if Christianity had been the predominant religion. What am I saying to you? I'm saying that sometimes, in a moment, a window of opportunity opens, and we better be very sensitive to saying no. Even if there's opposition, because opposition is inevitable. It didn't deter the Apostle Paul, and when the road gets tough and steep, it should not deter us. Remember, we're on the winning side, and we shall overcome because he has overcome. You notice we're talking today about seeking the Lord's will in your decisions. We're talking about doors of opportunity opening and then I want you to notice finally the reality of opposition. You see it in the text. But I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost. For a wide door of effective work has opened to me, but there are many adversaries. The Apostle Paul, assuming everyone knew that the world is in chaos, wrote this, the whole creation is groaning, waiting for the day of redemption. We feel that in our contemporary society today. Romans 8.22 is what he quotes. He further went on to say, don't be shaken by the troubles you're going through. You know that we are destined for such trouble. 1 Thessalonians 3.3. 3. In fact, the anonymous writer of the book of Hebrews gives us such a vivid early description of the early church and what they endured, that it's breathtaking. Listen to this. Hebrews 11, 35 through 38. The writer of Hebrews commends those whose faith in God was so vast, so real, so genuine, they were being tortured, refusing to be released so they may gain even a better resurrection. Others faced jeers and flogging and even chains and imprisonments. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and holes in the ground. That's the pedigree of our ancestors in the faith. Our Lord Jesus Christ was with them through all the agonizing descriptive experiences of challenge they faced. Our Lord promises his followers peace that passes all understanding. Here's a stirring application to me to this whole business of seeking the will of God, knowing that effectual doors of opportunity are opening, but with it comes many adversaries. Unless your theology of the Lord Jesus and his kingdom transcends your temporal desire for life, health, and happiness, you will always be shaken by the chaos in your life. But if you know the God whose kingdom never ends and believe that life is only a stepping stone to the next life, then you will not 
clutch too closely the absence of chaos as evidence of Christ's love for you, which is something Wade Burlinson once said. You know, back in 1969, Paul Simon wrote a song you've heard before entitled Bridge Over Troubled Waters. The closing words are like a bridge over troubled waters. I will ease your mind. I want you to know something. Jesus is not our bridge over troubled waters. He is the stability of our souls and the rock of our hope right smack dab in the middle of all the turmoil around us. Take that to heart as we face a troubling election year. As we look and see the cost of everything on average has gone up 42% over the last four years. Interest rates on mortgages are sky high compared to what they were a few years ago. We're still recovering from COVID. And there's still people that stay out of church because of it. We have seen, the. do you know 10 years ago, the average church ran about 130 people, and now it's about 60 people. We have seen the rise of disinterest for the things of God in almost an unparalleled fashion. Israel is fighting a war in Gaza with the northern Hezbollah in Lebanon threatening them all the time with, with missiles shooting over. Iran is rattling their sword you have Israel squeezed in by the world's lack of compassion, thinking that we should cheer the terrorists. It's just crazy. It's like the world's upside down. Against the backdrop of the frustration of the current life experience that you and I are having, the passage today brings such comfort because Paul could say, like, we need to hear that seek the Lord in your decisions. Great opportunities are around you. Don't be so dismal. Don't be so distressed. Don't be so dismissive. Believe God for something more. But do realize that it's going to get worse before it gets better. We know how the Bible ends. We win. There's no devil in the first two chapters of Genesis and no devil in the last two chapters of Revelation. God's people win. But we go through many trials and tears and heartache. And the Apostle Paul said it best, I think, in Acts 14, when he said, we all, through many difficulties, must enter the kingdom of God. We know that. We're not learning anything really new here, except the emphasis is so incredibly acute and appropriate for these times we live in. Under that title, Opportunities and Opposition, Seek the Lord's will for your decisions, will you? Doors of opportunity are opening. Do you believe it? And then understand this, the reality of opposition, expect it. And stand strong. Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Father, thank you for these dear friends who are watching today. Some are facing really uphill battles and challenges on every front, and they're weary of well-doing. Remind us that we shouldn't be because we'll reap a harvest if we don't faint. Don't give up. It's always too soon to quit. Help us to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy before him endured the cross he endured the cross so that we could enjoy eternal life with him. But that doesn't mean we'll have an easy go of it here. So help us when we're discouraged or discontent to trust in your wisdom for our decisions, to lean into expectancy of opportunities, and to anticipate obstacles. But at the end of the day, Christ in us is the hope of glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Pastor Mark Hensley here from the Pikes Peak Park Baptist Church in Colorado Springs, hoping you will be reminded as I need to be reminded to seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him 
while he is near. We need his wisdom for our decisions. We need to see the opportunities and we need to anticipate opposition. But we press on towards the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Bye, folks.